This crisis has blurred the lines between private business and government in unexpected ways. These bailouts and all the important pieces in the jigsaw puzzle that support business should uh, come with strings attached. Faced with economic catastrophe, the government became lender and paymaster of last resort. I think what you can evolve to now is making sure that every company is responsible to all of its stakeholders. Has it changed your view on businesses' place in society? I think shareholders need to say, we believe that the most successful companies over the long term will be doing their bit for society, won't be taking the shortcuts. What should be expected from business after Covid? The financial crisis started with mortgages and banks, but the downturn reverberated far beyond the City of London and Wall Street. We must, in an uncertain and unstable world, be the rock of stability upon which British people can depend. As panic settled into years of slow growth and stagnant wages, some saw an opportunity missed, an opportunity that perhaps has come again. We dealt with the 2008 financial crisis in a very limited and technocratic way. But we didn't fundamentally rethink the way risks are shared in the economy and how we look after people. That legacy is what has haunted our politics in recent years. One fascinating aspect of discussion at the moment is the number of business leaders who are already talking in terms of new models, new paradigms. I think there's a lot of willingness to explore imaginative new solutions and more inclusive, more um, sustainable solutions. While many businesses were shutting down, Co-op was stocking up. It needed 5,000 extra workers in lockdown. Co-op Group is owned not by shareholders, but by its members. It's a different model of organising a business, one that makes its boss accountable for more than just growth. I'll be very much assessed by the social impact that I can have in communities, um, by how much money we can raise for good causes, by where our efforts go around campaigning. And so it's a far more deeper, richer assessment than possibly a PLC CEO might go through. The idea that companies should be serving a wider range of interests than just investors has been increasingly discussed in recent years, but attempts to formalise it, like Theresa May's move to put workers on boards, didn't get very far. And there is scepticism that shareholders will be the ones to push it further. Most of the investment, especially these days, is speculative. It is easy money. Investors may have um, wanted companies to make a song and dance about climate change, but nothing fundamental changed in uh, the important decisions that businesses reached regarding emissions, regarding their attitude to climate change. It was a lot of window dressing. Usually, this centre would be full of children making the most of its summer schemes. We sort of wanted to be a, almost like a modern youth club. There's recording studios, dance studios, we've got pop videos. The Harmony Youth Group gets money from Co-op's Members Fund. We are based in Halliwell, which is one of the most deprived wards in Bolton. And basically, you've got your, your, your most deprived groups, your refugees, your single parents, you're unemployed, you're young unemployed, and they're all in a mishmash, and young people need a safe environment where they can come, socialise, and just express themselves in a positive manner, and that's what we're trying to do here, really. The cooperative model is one that may have broader lessons for business. In those first five years of difficult start-up, twice as many co-ops survive than the normal business, and therefore, it suggests to me that our way of working, our governance, our accountability is a better way of doing business. That way of working will chime with a new zeitgeist of how businesses run. 
Unlike in 2008, there's of course no company or sector that's particularly at fault in the pandemic. But many businesses will have benefited from some kind of public support in this extraordinary period. And the public mood seems pretty unforgiving of those that aren't seen to be doing the right thing or playing by the rules. The question is whether COVID marks a moment where companies are increasingly held accountable to a wider range of interests than just their shareholders. It should make many business people realise that they have a licence to operate from the society in which they function. Uh, and, and, it's, and whilst there are many aspects of it that are tricky, I think it should mean the absolute dominance uh, of, of a shareholder maximisation culture, often at the expense of everything else, uh, might, might have seen its peak. And, and we go back to uh, a more complex uh, form of business engagement with society. I think it's going to be really important in terms of what businesses do within for the communities where, they, where their employees work, where they can invest, where they can really help socially. Personally, I think the traditional models, not, they don't need to completely change. They need to be adapted for what's right for the future. And what's right, I think, is very much support the most vulnerable in society and, and make sure we have employment for everybody and make sure that we really support the lower paid being able to progress in the UK. As the UK gets further from the start of this pandemic, business may simply cross over to the next set of challenges. Unsustainable debt levels and vulnerabilities that COVID has exposed in supply chains and systems geared to ever greater efficiency. This Scottish manufacturer of outdoor clothing was squeezed when COVID hit its supplies from Asia, but it expanded into making medical gowns and overhauled its logistics. Obviously, price is quite key because we're in a very competitive market. Um, but we've managed to source as much as we possibly can locally in terms of materials, in terms of what we call trims, whether it's elastics, whether it's cuffing, these type of things. The company would like to buy more closer to home, but the choice isn't always there. It might also require a shift from customers, like the public sector buyers for whom price has tended to trump quality or provenance this whole situation has really highlighted how dependent we are on other countries. I think it will be important for business, uh, people in business and people at government level um, to start rethinking some of that process. Has resilience become a higher priority for business and for government? The global supply network, people insisting on the cheapest prices and going to the cheapest labour markets, these shortcuts have ended up costing us. And so I think government has now the moral high ground to say to businesses and reminding consumers that actually if you insist on paying the lowest price, you will end up causing damage. I think resilience comes more and more into focus as something which is the only way to respond to this. But I think that only comes out as a priority when people have thought quite a lot about the kind of world we're in, about the fragility of our situation, about the things we can't predict and don't know. Is our new perspective one that will reshape how we respond to economic crises and how interventionist we think the state should be? I think we need a new social contract between people in society and between the generations. What do we owe to those who kept working during the worst of the panic? On a good day, I try to imagine that uh, we will be thanking COVID-19 for giving us an opportunity to rethink those issues. And what do we ultimately want from our COVID economy? Mm -hmm.